March and apply for that fall year and I have to wait. But I wanted to ask you, um, you know, I had to do it in order to get the time. If I were to take February, it would be, you know, regular time. Which, you know, now that it gives my doctor enough times for me to get those documents and send it to LSAC, um, am I still okay for fall or is it going to have to be spring of 2023? I mean, March is late. I'll, yeah. I'll be honest with you about it. I wouldn't be serving you by saying it's fine. Don't worry. And yes, March with extra time is better than February with no extra time. If you need the extra time, obviously you're going to see a big score boost to get what your full potential would reflect by going for March. But it is quite late in the admission cycle. Yeah. So some schools will still take March results but you've got much better chances as well as more scholarship money by waiting a cycle and applying in the fall instead. Yeah. Cause the issue is they can take you, but they won't give you that money because exactly. all, the, all the money ran out. Mm -hmm. So you would, you would say, cause I, if I'm not mistaken, once you score in the LSAT, you have five years, that score, it, it stays with you for five years. So essentially you'd recommend, you know, you get your score, but you wait until the next cycle to apply early. Exactly. Okay. I see what you're saying. Okay. Um, now, uh, just going, going back to what I told you about the specific question. So um, just all the three sections in general, um, I want to talk about sufficient assumption first. Okay. Between the two, sufficient assumption necessary, I find necessary assumption easier. I don't know if that's a general rule. Maybe other students find necessary assumption easier, but I find the NA much easier than SA. And the, you know, sufficient assumption is like formula based with the valid forms. But I want to ask you, is there any way that I can do sufficient assumption without having to rely on like the formula base? I know those question types are like very formula oriented, but I'll be honest with you. I do not like the valid forms. You know, I, I understand you have to know them, the sum and the most, but they don't, it's not that they throw me off. It's just, I, I prefer not to look at the question that way and set it up like a formula. Is there another way that I can do the sufficient assumption question? Great question. Yeah. But first off, you mentioned some and most. Those don't apply to sufficient assumption. Yes, those a stimulus can contain those words. But when I think sufficient assumption, I don't think about the words some and most. They're just okay. not in my vocabulary for this question type. I'm thinking about what's going to guarantee the argument 100% leaving no ambiguity at all. And the good news is that most sufficient assumption stimuli don't actually require you to diagram anything. You could do most of them in your head pretty easily. There are a couple of really tough ones that I would challenge anybody to do in their head. By the way, an example of that would be the Wiggs question in prep test 58. Super hard question. I need to diagram it for sure. But that's rare. Most sufficient assumption questions are just looking for a restatement of the argument in broader terms or the contrapositive of the argument possibly in broader terms as well. That's a lot of them. Another really common format would be simply connecting the new term in the conclusion back to back to the evidence. Usually there's going to be some, in a lot of, in a lot of the cases, there's going to be some new concept in the conclusion that never appeared in the evidence. And so justifying its presence there by linking it back to the evidence will guarantee the argument. Well, essentially, sufficient assumption in the answer choices, it brings on new information that guarantees the conclusion. That yes, we have to, yes, we have to okay. view sufficient assumption questions from the perspective that they're opening the door to new information in the answer choices. And the correct answer, if true, would guarantee the argument 100%, leaving no ambiguity at all. I do recommend watching the workshops where I break it down with formulas because it can help you even if you don't draw things out on test day. It can help you see them in a different way. But ultimately, if you don't want to diagram them, in most cases, you don't need to and you'll still be fine. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, I understand for certain question types, like, you know, parallel reasoning, 
um, you know, other other question types, you're going to have to diagram, you know, you're going to have those questions in NLR that you're going to have to diagram. It's just well, parallels. I would diagram sometimes, not all the time. Sometimes. Okay. Parallel you would diagram sometimes. So, I mean, I, you know, I guess you could say it's just a different way of, of cooking, cooking your food. I just rather do SA uh, with the least amount of diagramming possible. Um, and maybe that's why I prefer the NA, you know, necessary assumption over the SA, but I'm going to try, um, you know, with that, with that input that you just put of, you know, is the answer choice is going to have new information and it's the answer choice is going to be powerful that it proves the conclusion 100%. Yep. Uh, my second question was uh, for the curveball games. So, you know, I've done a couple curveball games already. And what I'm seeing is, is once I diagram it, it's, it's not as difficult because you have it diagrammed already. You just have to follow the rules and, and, you know, you have to make sure your conditional logics, you know, okay. My issue is, is when I'm reading the stimuli and it's that difficult stimuli in the, in the game, it's like, how do I even diagram this? So dif again, difficulty with the diagramming. Um, so, you know, not, not so much like the older games, like the pre test thirties and the twenties where like, you would have to do like a sequential order game, but it would have to be in a circle. Or, you know, though, because I feel like that's not really relative in the newer LSATs, but more so, I would say, convoluted games that are like a mixture between grouping and sequential order, and it re revolves heavy on, 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 on logic, on conditional logic, I would say. So, it's, you know, just those, just those games that you're like, okay, how do I diagram this? You know, it, does, it doesn't fit the stigma between the basic in and out, you know, grouping and basic sequential order or double, double sequencing, those type of games. Yeah, I hear where you're coming from there. So the first step is to make sure that you are airtight, solid in your understanding of the basic game types. So I would want you to, for example, grouping in out games. I want you to be able to do all the regular grouping in out games without issue. Obviously, I don't need you to get 100% on every single one all the time, but to be able to set up at least the main diagram proficiently without any issues. That's the first step. You got to be able to do the components in isolation before you're going to bring them all together. In a combination game, yeah, it's going to be harder and they're not going to always as neatly fit the mold as some of the more basic game types do. So you've got to be a little bit flexible, a little bit adaptable and recognize that not every rule is going to go on the main diagram. Some will be a little bit abstract and might need to go on the side. Some of them can't even be diagrammed in a symbolic way, but you're just going to have to write down a few words to represent what that rule is actually saying, especially in what I would call the curveball games, which may not even have a grouping in out element or a sequential element, but might be more like a pattern game. Those might contain only two or three rules and you have to hold one of them in your head and then just make sure you understand it thoroughly so you can apply it consistently. So, I mean, because the issue with those games, to me, there's a lot of ambiguity. And when there's, there's a lot of ambiguity, it's like, okay, how do, I, how do I start this, you know? Yeah. Well, one step would be look at how LSAC sets it up if there is an orientation question associated with the game. That can give you a general idea, a general guideline as to how you might set it up. So I essentially also... the first, the first uh, question, I mean, yeah, with the first question, with the which are the following based off uh, the scenarios, you know, like it fits and you have to cross out each answer choice based off the rules. Yeah, exactly. Okay. okay. So those are those are often a gimme in logic games. And the bonus is that they can also give you a sense of how to lay it out <laughs> if you didn't really have a sense of it from the rules or the initial paragraph. Another thing I'll say is that the local questions in the game, those if questions, if X were on slot three, then what must be true? Something like that. Those if questions can give you a jumping off point where maybe there isn't a whole lot of work that you've done for the main diagram. But if you start with those if questions and start drawing a new scenario, the rules combined with whatever local limitation they're giving you can help you get started to actually make a scenario. And once you have one scenario, that can help you build some momentum over the course of the game. No, that, that has definitely helped me a lot. And I, not only have I done that with games, but we're really comp as well. So, you know, the if questions first do them. And then, you know, the question like, which of the following cannot be true, which is more ambiguity. Uh, it helps you 
potentially answer the other ambiguity questions. So I've I've tried to do the those questions first that they give you a premise based off a, a new, you know, if X is in or Y is in, you know, that specific uh, piece, the game piece. I do those first and then try to solve the other ones. Perfect. That, yeah. And we're reading comp. We're reading comp. Uh, I've tried applying that as well with answering the main primary purpose first and the you know, main point of the passage. And then, you know, the inference questions last. Awesome. Solid. It's the way to go. And uh, so then also uh, I want to talk about method of reasoning. Uh, I'm having difficulty method, met, method of reasoning in LR because the answer choices, the language is very convoluted. So like the answer choices for method of reasoning is like, okay, what was uh, the reasoning or, you know, the part. And when I get to the answer choices, I'm not sure because of the language and the answer choice. And it's really, it's really, sometimes it, it can be long if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, you want to make sure that you understand every single term they're using in any of the answer choices, not just the correct ones. So during your review process, look up any word you don't understand, keep a running list, look them up later. And then during your review process, also check to see how the term in the answer choice applies to the stimulus. So when they said intermediate conclusion, what is the intermediate conclusion in this stimulus if it had one? Identify that part. Find what is the evidence. Find what is the counter premise. Find what is the analogy. It's not enough to just know what an analogy is. You have to know what is the analogy in this argument. Sometimes they'll try to make you think that something is an analogy when it's not. It might be an example instead. So getting really granular and nitpicky on those details can help you avoid wrong answers and choose right answers. But this all happens during the review process, and that's why it takes so long. How would you say you can improve that during the Socratic review method, during that review process as far as, okay, how do I know this is an example or an analogy? You just, you're just you asking yourself scenarios in your head based off the answer choices of why this answer choice is wrong, et cetera? Well, once you know the correct answer, during your review process, you can try to reverse engineer what made the right answer right, what made the wrong answer wrong, but beyond that, you have to get into your own thought process as to what made the right answer unappealing and what made the wrong answer tempting, or was I just confused and didn't know the vocabulary words or what they were referring to? And if that's the answer, then you've got to look up definitions. You have to slow down, maybe look at an explanation, maybe watch one of the previous class recordings covering that problem, or bring your problems to class, ask your questions there, discuss it with others in the study groups. Doesn't have, you don't have to do it all alone. You may not have all the answers yourself, but you should try yourself at least at first and then look for support when you need it. Thank you very much. That, that was help clearing up as far as, you know, looking up the words. And then lastly, uh, um, for most longest, um, you know, MSS, most strongly supported, I have difficulty sometimes with narrowing it down to one answer choice. I always have uh, two answer choices for most strongly supported. I'm between two. And I know it, you know, for example, for most strongly supported, you can have all the answer choice that support it, but there's that one answer choice that supports it the most, you know? Great so question. Okay. I so think, I think that's my question, narrowing it down for most strongly supported. All right. So most strongly supported. Error cases, error cases a little, a little bit, bit, but, but typically, typically you're going to find four of them are not really supported by the stimulus at all. And one of this, them is supported a great deal, but the correct answer is kind of like Goldilocks. So it has to be just strongly supported enough. It's not always a must, but it's also not simply a could. It is something that is strongly suggested by the stimulus something we could reasonably assume that the author would agree with. It's not always 100% guaranteed. I think of it more like it's 90% guaranteed or 95% guaranteed. Like you wouldn't bet your life on it typically, but you might bet a hundred bucks. Okay. I, li I like that analogy. That's a good analogy. 
that that could so that way I can see it in that spotlight. Okay. And then uh for reading comp, just uh before I ask my my last question as far as for uh a little more guidance for a plan, study plan. I, I've even though I've read some of the study plans that you have for one month, two months, et cetera, for reading comp. Uh just the same thing. So like for example, if uh if I grasp a passage, there's some questions that I have difficulty with answering because I'm not sure what they're I know, I know what they're asking, but I'm not 100% like I know what to look for. So like the offered, you know, for example, the author of the passage will most likely agree with, and then they give you the Kumbulu language for the answer choices. I've noticed uh, I, I get confused with that question type. Uh, the, the primary purpose as well, not the main point. The main point I'm able to grasp once I grasp the passage, but I would say primary purpose of the passage, and then the, uh, the author will most likely agree with blank, and then they give you the answer choices. Okay. Okay. Well, primary purpose, I want to start there because that one should be easier than author most likely agree. Primary purpose and main point are very similar. And mm -hmm. they, I'm not saying that they're easy, but you should orient your reading comp question solving approach to start there. Because if you don't know, if you don't know the main point, if you don't know the reason the author wrote this passage, then how much do you really know? It's kind of like watching a movie, but not knowing what genre it was. So you should know whether it's a horror movie or a romantic comedy or an action movie, right? And those are broad strokes. Then you can narrow down more specifically to the plot, but you got to know the genre. Similarly for reading comp, we want to know why did the author sit down and write this? What is the major thing they're trying to communicate? If they could leave you with only one thing, one idea, what would that be? So I want you to approach the main point, primary purpose, like it was a logic games orientation question. Start there, use it to ground yourself. And unlike logic games, you can go into reading comp main point or primary purpose with a prephrase, an idea, a prediction. How do you articulate the main idea? And then look for LSAC's description of it. If that can guide you a little bit, you should at least be able to knock out three of the choices. And then out of the remaining two, in a lot of cases, the tempting wrong answer will be something that is technically true, but is not the main point, or is not the main reason why the author wrote this. It might've been a side detail, or might've been limited to only one paragraph out of three paragraphs. Definitely. I like that orientation example, you know, or... You can see if the other wants you to take away with one thing and based off that one takeaway, if it doesn't matter, it's the answer choice, you can cross it right away and then narrow it down. That, that's definitely a good uh, ideology. I appreciate that. And then, uh, um, yeah, no, just finally, I wanted to ask you as far as uh, for an ideal plan based on- one, one more thing before the ideal plan, you also mentioned the inferential questions. Author most likely to agree. I want to make sure we cover that too. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. Yes, I forgot about that. The author will most likely agree with. So- uh, Sometimes with those questions, I think I get them wrong because I have an understanding of the passage, but it's not 100%, you know, so it's, uh, you know, you, you read a passage or like you said, you watch a movie, you, you, you basically understand the basis of the movie, but you, you, you didn't grasp the movie 100%. So I guess that's my takeaway as far as maybe why I'm struggling with the author will most likely agree with. Yeah, sure. So the author most likely agree with just to continue this movie analogy, this could be a minor subplot that you didn't care about at all with a minor character that you didn't care about at all. But it happened for three minutes out of a two hour movie or more. And you have to go back and rewind and catch it. You have to scan back through the whole movie for that one little thing that wasn't aside. And if you'd gone to a, the bathroom and came back, you wouldn't have even missed anything. Yeah. Or felt like you did. These questions can be like that sometimes. You never really know what they're going to be. I mean, if they say, the author would most likely agree with what? There's a million things they are likely to agree with. So you can't prephrase this. Instead, you've got to likely work more by process of elimination and then see for each choice, do I remember that happening? If the answer is maybe, then that's when you go back and look. So you don't have to go from A to E. If C is a maybe, start with C and scan through the passage looking for what might have referenced 
choice C or supported choice C. You can also use control F or command F to find keywords more quickly. It's not always going to give you the answer, but it can definitely help. So I would test that out. And make sure during your review process that you always can find specific support in the text for those correct answers. It's there. It might be buried. It might be paraphrased. It might be referred to in the negative. So for example, if John only works Monday through Friday, we can infer he does not work Saturday or Sunday, even though the words Saturday and Sunday don't appear in the text. It's implicit. It's so implicit. It's harder, to, so it, it's harder to spot on a scan, but it is still technically something we can infer based on the, the passage text. So essentially, like, you know, if the answer choice has an analogy, but not the same exact analogy, because you know, it's obviously different. You go back to the passage and you try to find an analogy or something that the author agreed with that he used to see if it's similar. It may or may not be an analogy, but you want to look, yeah, you have the right idea. You want to look for some sort of example supporting that choice. Some, I'm sorry, some sort of an example supporting it. Okay. A detail. It could be a single, a single sentence in the entire passage, but that single sentence gives us a hint as to the author's opinion. And then we can reasonably assume or reasonably infer what they would most likely agree with going forward. Okay. I see. So it could be some sort of example and that could show his opinion, et cetera, and then that example can, can be something that the author agrees with in the answer choice. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah, no, I think those were perfect. I think those were the, some of the main, those were the issues that I had um, before I wanted to ask you just regarding based off everything you've heard and uh, ideally to make some type of a realistic plan based off what I told you for March and just, uh, you know, follow the process and, and trust the process and definitely keep, uh, using the the program you know i like it a lot i haven't finished all the the workshops but i plan to and uh and keep using it i enjoy it yeah awesome well i'm glad the program is helping you and i'm glad that you're allowing time we're aiming for march now speaking in mid-january you've got about two months and so there's a lot you can do in this time i would say that you already at this point it seems like you have a pretty solid foundation and familiarity with different sections different question types you've clearly been putting in the work I also, point, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to cut you off. I also don't want to give you the wrong impression. I I have gone through the question types, but I there's also some questions I feel like I haven't done enough compared to others. You get me? So I, yeah, I, like for example, totally. I've done I've done a lot of necessary assumption, but maybe I haven't done enough of method of reasoning. Like right. there's there's some questions I've done not as much. All right. Well, the first step is then fill in those gaps. Review the question types you don't feel as confident in. Watch the foundational videos covering those types watch the workshops covering those types, and then drill some questions of those types. That's the first thing. Maybe you spend another week or two on that specifically. And then, because March isn't that far off, I would start doing at least one full-length practice test a week and review it in depth. So take the next week, review any weak areas that you're aware of, watch the foundational and workshop lessons covering those types. After you've done that, start up with the full length exams and reviewing those in depth. Also the classes show up to the live classes. We have live classes Monday through Thursday, every single week. There's classes and study groups you can attend before and after. You don't have to attend all of them, of course, but if you're working on logical reasoning that day and logical reasoning happens to be the class tonight, if you're available, I would attend. Ask your, bring your questions, ask your questions. Work through problems with others, especially as you're reviewing. Perfect, thank you. I, I definitely appreciate that. Uh, I, I've joined uh, I've, uh, two classes, I believe, right now, but I just want to let you know, um, starting and as the LSAT date gets closer because this is a family business, I'm going to be able to mitigate and go from three, three days out of the week working to two. Nice. To have, to have more time working. And, you know, I'm thankful, thankful, you know, that I'm able to do that. So I think that's going to give me a, a huge gap as well, as far as being able to cover the week areas and, and uh, show more, show more often up to live classes. But I, I do like the, you know, one full length practice test a week. I wanted to ask you as far as for blind review, you know, I, I, cause I know that's where it grows. 
how long would you say it takes to blind review uh, a practice test in depth fully? Is it take a three at two hours, three hours? I mean, I've, I've even heard people that it takes them a whole entire day, like up more than four hours, obviously within breaks um, to blind review a whole exam. It could. The review process takes a long time when done properly and done fully. So that's why I'm saying, given that you you work with the family business, I wasn't going to say two exams a week because then you may not have enough time to review them all thoroughly and work on weak areas as well. So yes, it can take four hours. It can take a day. Part of it depends on how many questions you get wrong, how many questions gave you difficulty, and then how thoroughly are you reviewing each question. You'll see in my classes, for example, I'll spend an entire hour reviewing one passage in depth and might not even discuss the questions. For logical reasoning, once I spent two mm-hmm. classes where I focused on one question. Well, so okay. you can go deep with it. You can analyze questions or passages from a variety of different angles. You don't have to do that every single time. But if the question is really giving you trouble and you think there are really some takeaways and insights to be gained from going that deep, then do it. Obviously, you don't have 50 years to do this. There are trade-offs you have to make. But for your questions you get wrong and have difficulty with, it's worth taking some time. Okay. And then finally, my, my last question I wanted to ask you. Um, so as far as for practice tests, I was thinking about starting at 50, you know, 50 going all the way to 90. I've done some of the newer ones because I did take November. You know, I've, I've done 92. I've done prep test 90, uh, prep test 76, and, you know, those newer ones. Well, would you say starting from 50 or maybe 55 and then working my way up? And then would you say, do I have to do all the games from prep test one to 30? Because I, when I was on seven stage, I mean, I still I still have that program to to cover the all the games that it has. And all everyone says on that community says uh, that, you know, oh, if you do games one through 30, it's going to give you a solid foundation. Um but like I told you, and you're aware, some of those games are, are fairly old and they don't apply to the, to the newer versions. It's a good question. I mean, again, there can be trade-offs. You only have so much time. You've got to budget it accordingly. Okay. There's definitely benefits to be gained from doing all those old games, but there's also a lot of benefits doing more recent exams as well. So you kind of have to pick and choose where to allocate your time. And that's why, again, I'm saying one exam a week, not two exams a week for you. And do these older games or do some older logical reasoning or whatever you need a little bit on the side in addition to those full length exams. And then anytime you can get away from work to devote to the LSAT will definitely be to your benefit as well. Um, Apologies, I have to sign off in a moment. I have another call waiting for me. No, no, absolutely. I mean, you've been more than enough because honestly, I'll be honest with you. I want to take this March and that's it. I'm done. You know, this has been honestly over a year and something journey now i mean since the beginning of the pandemic i mean i started studying my diagnostic like march of 2020 so it's going to be two years pretty soon if i'm not mistaken so that's like i want to that's it go you know go all in and and get it over with and and uh, enjoy my the fruit of the labor in the long run and just get started with law school i should say you know so for sure sure jc well it's great to meet with you again I'm impressed by your dedication. You're clearly putting in the work. I have no doubt you'll get a great result. Reach out if you need anything. I'm here for you. Thank you so much, Steve. I appreciate it. And you have an amazing day. You too. Take care. Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.